The year was 1805. The first French Empire, or the Napoleonic Empire, led by Napoleon Bonaparte, was the dominant land power in Europe. Napoleon had plans of total European and world domination by means of military and trade. Only one last great obstacle was blocking his path, the Empire of Great Britain. Great Britain had control of the seas by use of their naval power and thus controlled the means of trade to the East and West Indies. This trade to the East and West Indies was crucial to the French economy. Napoleon's only answer to gain control of the trade routes was to meet and destroy the English fleet. Napoleon had tried once to gain control of the waters, the Mediterranean mainly, but lost to Admiral Nelson of Great Britain at the Battle of the Nile. The French were in alliance with the Spanish, and with the combined fleet, soon planned an attack on the main British fleet. Napoleon pressured his admirals to attack the English as soon as possible, and destroy it. But sadly, his fleet had been sitting at port for nearly two years. Napoleon's knowledge of water warfare was abysmal compared to his land tactics. He threatened his admirals that if they did not attack now, then he will find someone who will. On October 21st, 1805, just before the clock struck noon, the fleet of Great Britain and the fleet of France and Spain met off the southwest coast of Spain, west of Cape Trafalgar. Equipment and ships used by both combatants were evenly matched and of cutting edge technology for their time. Ships were capable of going 13 knots or 15 miles per hour. The ships were rated into classes. First class was 90 guns and above. Nelson's flagship, the HMS Victory, was a first class ship. It had 100 guns and had 850 men on board. Second class was 80 guns third class was 70 guns. Ships of this time primary weapons were muzzle loading cannons firing cannonballs ranging between 18 and 36 pounds. These cannons were capable of penetrating the hulls of these ships at up to 1,000 yards. Each ship had a complement of marines armed with muzzle loading flint lock muskets. Marines were given the task of killing enemy sailors providing both offense and defense capabilities during boarding actions. Each sailor was armed with a cutlass, pike, and or small axe for boarding actions. Admiral Nelson ordered his ships not to put marines up in the crow's nest, fearing that they would ignite the sails. But the French and Spanish put their best sharpshooters up in the sails, hoping to pick off officers. British sailors and marines had been at sea maintaining the British Empire well longer than the French and Spanish had been at sea. They had superior skill at loading and firing cannons and muskets. The average British gun group could fire three shots per five minutes, while the French and Spanish could only fire two shots per five minutes. The British fleet, though, however, was outnumbered by the combined fleet, 33 to 41 man-of-war ships. As the two fleets drew closer, anxiety began to build among officers and sailors. One English sailor described the time before as, during this momentous preparation, the human mind had ample time for meditation, for it was evident that the fate of England rested on this battle. At 11.45 a.m., Nelson sent the famous flag signal, England expects that every man will do his duty. British fleet divided into two relatively parallel columns and were heading north-eastward at right angles to the combined fleet of the French and Spanish. The combined fleet gunner's goal was to fire into the British sails and rigging from a long distance away in an attempt to disable the British sails and rigging before the British could get in close enough where their superior skills could be used. 
Meanwhile, the British gunner's tactics was to get in close to the enemy ships and use their gunnery skills to disable and destroy the hull of the enemy ships, to kill the crew and disable their cannons so marines could board and capture the ships. Just before noon, the two British columns came under fire from a long distance. The second British column, led by Admiral Collingwood, was the first to penetrate the combined fleet's battle line. Captain Claude Hardy of the Victory noted later in his journal, the Victory by this time, having approached close to the enemy's van, had suffered very severely without firing a single shot. She had lost about 20 men killed and had about 30 wounded. Her topmast and all her sails and their booms on both sides were shot away, the enemy's fire being chiefly directed at her rigging with a view to disable her before she could close with them. Soon after, Admiral Nelson's comm also penetrated the battle line. The opening British volley of cannon fire was devastating to the French and Spanish ships because they fired into the vulnerable bow and stern of the enemy ships, thereby killing hundreds of sailors and disabling dozens of cannons. As the British ships broke through the line, they engaged individual ship-to-ship -ship fighting where British gunnery skills gave them the advantage over the French. Meanwhile, the French Admiral Villeneuve had lost control over the combined fleet as individual ship captains began engaging targets of their own choosing. The HMS Victory became entangled with the French ship the Redoubtable and was engaged in point-blank firing. The French used this to their advantage because they put their sharpshooters in the fighting tops and were picking off British officers who stood out in their uniforms. At 1.10 p.m., a French sharpshooter on the Redoubtable shot Admiral Nelson in the lower spine, mortally wounding him. Nelson was brought below deck and control of the battle was given to Admiral Collingwood. While below deck, Nelson was bleeding to death and his medical staff were unable to treat his wound due to the lack of medical technology and knowledge. For three hours, Nelson lay below deck unable to control the course of the battle. Nelson to his doctor said, I have to leave Lady Hamilton and my adopted daughter Horatia as a legacy to my country. At 4.30 p.m., the great Admiral Nelson died of his wounds. Meanwhile, above deck, the British gunnery proved to be the decisive factor in the battle, as French and Spanish ships were forced to surrender in one-on-one -on -one ship fighting. At 2.30 p.m., the first Spanish ship, the Santimisa Trinidad, the biggest man-of-war in the world, surrendered, and soon became a domino effect for many French and Spanish ships. At the end of the battle, 17 ships of the combined fleet were in British hands. A storm blew up after the battle, however, forcing the British to scuttle many of their hard-won prizes. The British had lost 458 killed and 1,208 wounded while the French had 2,218 killed and 1,155 wounded, and the Spanish had 1,025 killed and 1,383 wounded. Nelson's body was put into a barrel of rum to preserve his body for the trip home so he could have a hero's funeral. The news of Nelson's victory reached England on November 6, where rejoicing at the defeat of the enemy's fleet and the end of the invasion threat was tempered by grief at the loss of their nation's greatest hero. The Battle of Trafalgar, one of the most decisive victories in naval history. The victory confirmed the naval supremacy that Britain had established during the past century and was the beginning of a century of almost unrivaled dominance for the Royal Navy. The battle and Nelson would be remembered in the City of London with monuments built in their honor, Nelson's Column and Trafalgar Square. In the summer of 2005, with the 200th anniversary of the battle approaching, the people of London gathered at Trafalgar Square to celebrate their victory over Paris in the selection of the 2012 Summer Olympic Games. <laughs>